All right, 2 p.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. Hope you can all see me and hear me properly and hope everyone's doing well. But today we're doing something a little bit different. So on Wednesday, we meant to get into something called R squared, which we didn't really have time to get into by the end. So today and tomorrow, Muhammad and I are taking a slightly different approach to the workshops, and we're going to give more of a typical lecture so we can catch you guys up to speed on not only the workshops, but for things like the midterm, the final, and just general knowledge that you should know by the time you leave this class. And if you haven't already downloaded it, um, this PDF, or I guess a PDF of this presentation is posted under Canvas, under Files, Workshops, and Workshop 6. So if you want to download it, mark along, annotate it as we go, do your thing, whatever, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so without further ado, here's a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to uh, review some curve fitting and go a little deeper into the theoretical background of curve fitting, because I don't think it was really made clear what exactly curve fitting is. And I also want to show you curve fitting from a slightly different perspective. But the most important part is we're going to get into this thing called R squared, or goodness of fit, which I hope at least most of you have heard of by this point in your career. And it's okay if you haven't, but I think it's you should have, have at least heard of it, maybe from like your freshman engineering classes, or even if you took like a physics class in high school or something. Okay, so let's get started. As usual, what I like to do is I like to start with the big picture, uh, talk about why this is important, uh, where all this fits in. And this is especially important because you guys have your midterm in six days. And so a lot of you are beginning to tunnel and start focusing on all these really, really small minute details which is great, and I highly encourage that. But it's equally as important to not get lost in the small details because believe it or not, everything we do in this class is interconnected. So here on the right, we have a list of uh, all the topics we cover in this class. I lifted this straight from the syllabus, straight from the syllabus on Canvas, so there should be no surprises here. In my opinion, linear algebra is the heart of everything we do. So I sort of took these concepts or some applications of these concepts and made a, like a mini flowchart out of this. So we start with linear algebra. It's a heart and soul. Linear algebra has applications to differential equations, nonlinear algebra, which is called root finding, which we're gonna do next, right after the midterm. And then we also get into this branch over here with these yellow squares, optimization, curve fitting least squares, and all these three lead to interpolation, which we may or may not cover right before the midterm, if we're scheduled. And then interpolation leads to, believe it or not, the trapezoid rule. And I'm going to talk about, if we have time at the end, I'm going to talk about how the trapezoid rule is basically one giant application of optimization and curve fitting, which by extension is an application of linear algebra. So linear algebra is by far the most important topic. And like I said last week, if you haven't brushed up on things like rank or what does it mean if, uh, if something is, a, uh, is consistent or what a determinant is, you should do that because you're going to need that knowledge because it's sort of the baseline knowledge. Okay, let me just pop up the chat. Oops, I lost it. Okay. There we go. Okay. So that, this is just sort of big picture stuff. Where does linear algebra and all that fit in? Well, it fits in everywhere. That's a short answer. Okay, so by now, I think you should fully understand that the basic idea behind curve fitting is you want to predict a trend between your system's input and output, or I guess a trend between your independent variable and your dependent variable. And for simplicity, let's just say we ran an experiment and we collected these two data points here at one, two, and at 4, 8. And the question is, what's the best fit line? Well, it doesn't take a genius to know that the best fit line is just the line that connects these two, right? So it's the simplest. And nothing, nothing pretty scientific about that. Pretty intuitive. But as I've said before, if you really want to succeed in this class, you should be very detail-oriented. You should be keeping track of everything, dimensions, variables, sizes, units, stuff like that. And here, I'm taking specific note of the fact that we have two data points and a first order polynomial. 
uh, first order polynomial is this line, the best fit line that connects these two data points. Okay. So here's a slightly more complex example. Instead of two data points, we have a third. So the best fit line isn't necessarily a line per se, but what if we try a parabola? And if we fit a parabola, we notice that this parabola uncoincidentally happens to pass through all three points. And once again, we're paying attention to the small details. We have three data points and we have a second order polynomial. That's just a parabola, all right? So are you starting to see a pattern with the number of data points and the degree of the polynomial you can fit? Well, two slides ago, we had two data points which were perfectly fit by a first order polynomial. And in the last slide, we had three data points and a second order polynomial. So I think we can sort of fit this pattern of you can perfectly fit an n minus oneth order polynomial through n data points, right? And this forms a unique best fit line or curve, right? So let's say we have this six element data set, right? And you, let's say you collected this data from an experiment and stuff. Um, well, in order to fit a best fit line, you would just fit a fifth order polynomial, right? Well, for this example, sure. But what if when you get to your junior and senior level labs, you collect, um, well, a lot of data points. And there are actually some, let me see, some, some problems with this. Yeah, so in practice, you're gonna collect a lot of data. Six data points is not a lot, but this is just sort of a simplified example. Let's say you wanna predict the relationship between drag force and velocity. So if I wanna switch this, uh, between drag force F and velocity. Well, and let's say you go down to the wind tunnel in Randolph, which fun fact, you actually do in one of your classes and you collect a hundred data points. If you use this relationship, this N minus one order polynomial to fit N data points, you collect a hundred data points. Are you gonna fit a 99th order polynomial to your data? No, absolutely not. That's, that's ridiculous. You would never do that. And mathematically, that wouldn't work out either for a whole host of reasons that we're not even going to get into. Plus, you typically would have some semblance of the relationship beforehand. And you may not know this now, but if you're looking at the relationship between drag force and velocity, F is just about proportional to V squared. So if you knew that beforehand, why would you fit a 99th order polynomial to 100 data points when you know that this relationship holds true, you should be fitting a parabola instead to see if the theory matches your experimental results. And, and second, the second big issue, 99.99999 whatever percent of experiments contain errors. If you, if you walk up to me and you show me someone who ran a completely perfect real world experiment, I will show you a liar, right? errors can and will mess up your curve fit. So when we construct a curve fit or some sort of line or polynomial, we have to account for those errors. And that leads us right into the field of what's called optimization. So if we go back to slide four, we see that we have optimization branching directly out from linear algebra. And if we go back to the current slide, back in optimization. Now in this class, we don't formally learn optimization, uh, but I think it's important to at least understand the framework because this is really what curve fitting is. And here's the definition from my very, very good friend, Wikipedia. And so when we optimize something, we are finding the best solution from all the possible solutions. Mathematically, we write this in what's called the standard form. And when we optimize something, we typically say we are minimizing some function f of x, f being called either the objective function or the cost function, depending on terminology, uh, whichever textbook you read and stuff like that. And actually, if you read Dr. Vick's textbook, he uses the term objective function in the curve fitting section. Okay, and you, and even though we say we're minimizing something, this is sort of a tangent, but optimization can also maximize something. So 
if given a set of materials, you can maximize the amount of volume you can make from those materials or something like that. And it turns out, if you want to maximize something instead of minimize something, you just minimize the negative of that cost function. It's actually kind of cool. But that's sort of a, a tangent that's unrelated, right? The, the most important takeaway from this slide, and once again, we don't touch optimization at all formally in this class whatsoever. But I'm introducing you to this slide because I'm introducing you to some of the terminology that shows up in curve fitting. So you'll see some of these words like optimization, best, objective function, cost function, minimize. They're all highlighted or underlined somewhere. And that's because these exact words or variations of these words are gonna show up when we talk more about curve fitting. So keep these keywords in mind because you're gonna see them again and again throughout this PowerPoint. Okay. So, so what's, what's the big deal? How does optimization relate to curve fitting? Well, let's say we take the six element data set from before and I tell you to fit a first order polynomial and only a first order polynomial. Well, there are six data points, n equals six, okay? And so you know that if you do n minus one equals five, you can perfectly approximate these six data points with the fifth order polynomial. But I asked you for a first order polynomial. Uh-oh. Well, let's go ahead and try to fit some straight lines. I would say, just from visual inspection, this is pretty good. If you put this on your test, um, I would say this is acceptable if we're just doing this visually and qualitatively. Okay, um, but, but there's a problem, right? It, it doesn't pass through any of these data points. But I, I, I told you that your first order polynomial needs to pass through all these data points, so this, this doesn't work. All right, how about this one, this red line? Well, that also doesn't work. We run into a pretty similar problem. No matter what we do, no matter how many first order lines you draw and where, and at what angle and whatnot, you're never gonna pass through all these data points. So no matter what line you draw, you're going to incur some penalty or cost, right? There's the terminology coming up again. And you're gonna incur a penalty or cost for two reasons. First, this data is clearly imperfect, right? And second, you are trying to force a perfect curve when it is mathematically impossible, according to this. And if you have a scenario like this, which comes up in practice all the time, you just gotta live with it. You just have to live with the errors you're gonna get. However, curve fitting seeks to minimize and mitigate those errors. You can keep drawing as many lines as you want, until you find the line which minimizes or optimizes your penalty, which is the error. So all these offsets, right? So how far away is, is the point from the line? Uh, turns out that there is one line which optimizes all the distances, and we're gonna get into that. Okay, so hopefully by now it's clear that curve fitting is simply an optimization problem because you're trying to minimize some sort of penalty when subjected to something that you can't mathematically do. Okay, so the million dollar question is, how do we objectively define the single best fit line? Emphasis on objectively for the objective function and the meaning single. We want one best fit line. Okay, so if we define the best fit line as the line or, or curve, because you may end up with a parabola or even like a fifth order polynomial, but this line or curve should minimize the discrepancy or the error between the data points and the line. And here's a mathematical expression of a straight line. It should look pretty familiar, hopefully no surprises here, with the exception of this last term called E. And this E is what we call a residual in curve fitting. Right? And uh, if we rearrange this equation one over here in terms of E, we get E or the residual or the error, and I'll sort of use those terms interchangeably, uh, so keep that in mind. We say that the residual equals the true value minus the approximate value. So the true value being your data point, and then the approximate value is the approximation from your best fit line. And notice that we have two constants, A0 and A1, which are constants for the, the best fit line equation. Right, and hopefully this is nothing earth shattering. Right, I think this is pretty straightforward where you have some sort of error, which is the difference between your actual value and the theoretical value. Right, so if you've done percent error or something, which we have in this class, this should look 
pretty much familiar based on that. Okay. Uh, I'm a very visual learner, and I know Dr. Vic and probably a lot of you are too. So here's a pretty graphical representation of what a residual is. So this is just copied from the last slide, the bottom of the last slide for convenience. But here we have the data point up here, which is obviously well above this regression line. And the residual is just the vertical height between the, where the data point lies and that corresponding point on the regression line. So this is just a pretty visual way of looking at it. And then if you're data point lies above the line, you have a positive error. If your data point lies below the line, you have a negative error. And ideally, what we should, what we want to get, the end goal is to have your data point lie exactly on the line, because that means you have no error. And that would mean you have a best fit. But obviously, this isn't always possible. Okay, so that was just a really brief treatment of curve fitting and residuals. And now I wanna take a much deeper and much more mathematical dive into what happens in curve fitting. Okay, so once again, the main question of curve fitting is how do we objectively define the best fit line? Well, over the years, there are a bunch of scientists, a bunch of really smart people who have proposed a lot of different methods to produce a best fit line. And I wanna examine five different methods and show you some of the pros and cons of these real quickly. And then of these five, we're gonna choose which one is objectively the best. Once again, objectively sticking to the terminology from uh, optimization. All right, so here's method A. In method A, this is pretty simple. All we're gonna do is we take these six data points and we're just gonna take the mean. We're gonna take the average. Everyone knows how to take the average. So. If we, if we uh, sort of express the meaning of the data in terms of uh, you know, A0 and A1 from the constants before, well, this is just a straight line, so that's easy, right? There's, there's no slope, slope is zero, so it's just Y equals A0 plus the error. Then you solve for the error and you get E equals Y minus the constant, which is, and the constant, by the way, is just the mean of this data. And in statistical terms, whenever we have a mean, we usually tend to put a bar over top of whatever variable. So in this case, y bar means the mean of y. So this is just saying the error or the residual is just the vertical distance between the data point y and the best fit line e. Okay, I think uh, this, is, this is pretty straightforward. All right, so now let's say we have n data points, in this case n equals six we can write the total residual as the sum of each individual residual. And the individual error, of course, is just gonna be that vertical distance between the point and then the mean. So what exactly does this do? This best fit line is good because we get one unique line, right? There's only one mean of this data set. There's no such thing as two means for, for this data set, right? There's only one. That's good. However, just looking at this data, you don't have to be a mechanical engineer to know that this, this is just bad. Like, like you can do so much better than this, right? Why not draw a diagonal line? Like why does this line have to be straight, okay? So this, this we'll call this the baseline method. We can clearly do better, right? But I included this because it is a baseline method. And when people started to, to develop curve fitting methods, this is the method that they use to compare their curve fit to, right? We're gonna come back to this later, so keep this in the back of your mind. In fact, there is quite a lot of utility to this method. Let's introduce this variable called S of T, or I might just call it ST, so it might flip flop. But this is the sum of the square of the residuals. So if we take all these residuals here, once again, this is a graphical look at the residuals, we take this distance, square it, then we take this distance, square it, and then do all and add, add it up for all these, we get this ST term. All right, once again, just looking at this visually, doesn't take a genius to know that there, these residuals here and here and here are pretty large. So this ST term is also going to be relatively large. And just sort of thinking about curve fitting, right, what's the point of curve fitting to produce a line that's pretty close to the data points. And if you have a line that's pretty close to the data points, your errors or your ST should be pretty small. So this is just another reason why averaging the data isn't really a good choice. But remember ST, because once again, this is the baseline method. 
So we're going to compare one of, uh, one of the four future methods to this method, and the means of comparison will be through ST. Okay, so just using the mean or the averages or best fit line proved to be pretty crappy. Well, what if instead of taking the average, we want to minimize the residuals? Once again, here's the equation for the residuals. If we generalize it to n data points, we can, take the, we can find what the total residual is if we sum all the individual residuals. All right, you remember optimization? So let's go back to slide eight. Optimization seeks to minimize some objective function. Okay, so if we go back, current slide, this is the objective, well, and by extension, this is the objective function which we are seeking to minimize. We want to minimize the total error, right? But there's, there's a big problem. If you take this two-point data set, as previously discussed, this is the best fit line. But with this new definition of minimizing the residuals in this fashion, this dashed line is also a best fit line. Why? Because you have a positive error, uh, yeah, a positive error here and a negative error here. But if you draw this line such that it goes through the midpoint of the data, this positive and this negative error will cancel. So technically, your, your total error is zero. But just sort of logically looking at this, does this look like a best fit line? Logically, no, not at all. So it turns out that any line passing through this midpoint, no matter how logical it may be, you could have a perfectly horizontal line or you know diagonal line like this, will by this definition be a best fit line. Now, another reason why this is bad because you can clearly have multiple best fit lines according to this definition, but we only want one. So this is also not a good choice. All right, let's try another method. So let's do something similar as method B, but instead of, yeah, so this is B right here, but instead of uh, minimizing just the residuals, we're gonna minimize the absolute value of the residuals. Okay, so these two equations are pretty much identical, um, except now we're using absolute values instead of just soft parentheses. Okay, so here's a different data set, and now we're exposing a completely different problem. We have four data points, right? However, any line in between these two dashed lines, so let's say our best fit line looks like this or something, will by this definition be a best fit line. Because once again, the, po the total positive and negative errors for a line that goes through these two dashed lines will cancel. So once again, we've minimized the absolute value of our residuals, but we, can, we still have the problem where we end up with multiple best fit lines, a potential for multiple best fit lines. So this is also not good. Okay, so this, this method, the minimax method is a little different. I actually like this one a lot just for other applications. This method seeks to minimize the distance that a single point lies from the line. So here's, here's our best fit line. And it's checking to see what's this distance, what's this distance, what's that distance, this and that. And it's gonna try to find the minimum, all right? And once again, th this can get confusing with all the mins and maxes and stuff. So make sure you're set on that. So the good news is that with the minimax method, we get a single line, which is good. The bad news is that this line is heavily, heavily skewed by outliers. And when you have experimental data, chances are you're gonna have outliers. So for curve fitting applications, this isn't necessarily the best choice. However, the minimax method is used in things like game theory, AI, finance, um, to minimize the possible loss in a worst case scenario. This is actually huge in the finance field and I was reading up about it last night. Um, there's some really, really interesting applications of the minimax method. So I would encourage you to find, like Google minimax method finance or something and then read up on some of the articles because it's actually pretty cool. But once again, for this application, we don't need it. Okay, finally, we have least squares regression. This is the objective function we are seeking to minimize. We want to minimize the sum of the square of the errors. And we call this objective function SR. This is really important, right? We're giving it its own variable and an equation label so you know it's important. 
All right, so graphically, this is what least squares look like. Here are the residuals. Here's the best fit line. Here are all the data points. And you can quite literally draw, like picture, picture the residual as one side of a square. And then if you construct the whole square, this is sort of what this equation is saying. And we want to minimize the total squares that we get. Because ideally, the closer the data points are to the line, the smaller these squares are going to get because the residual, which is one side of the square, is smaller. So this is where the name least squares come from because we want to minimize the number of squares or at least the size of the squares. All right. And unsurprisingly, this is the best method. Uh, we touched on this yesterday and Monday in class. Uh, it's ideal for many reasons, one of which is the fact that we get a single, unique single line that passes through, or that, well, not necessarily passes through, but we get a single line for the given data. All right. So long story short, this is by far the best of the five methods that people have come up with. So now that we're going to use least squares regression, the question then becomes, we have these constants A0 and A1. How do we find them? Well, uh, if you take SR, copy and pasted from the last slide, you can take the partial derivatives. And if you've had multivariable calculus, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. And you set, you take the partial derivative of SR with respect to A0 and A1, then you set to zero. But let's, let's ignore all this fancy partial derivative summation, all that, all this math, right? Let's think about what we're doing. We're trying to minimize SR, we're trying to minimize the sum of the square of the errors. How do you do that? And if you think back to Calc 1 or Calc 2, when you definitely had optimization problems, but you just didn't realize it, someone told you to minimize this function f of x, what'd you do? Well, you differentiate it. And then you differentiate it again. You take the second derivative. And so we're doing something similar here, where you take the derivative of this function, you set it to zero, and that's going to help you um, not only uh, minimize SR, but it's going to help you solve for these constants too. Because here we get two equations, equation seven and equation eight, and now we have two unknowns, A0, A1. Huh. Well, if you simplify those two equations, you get this, and I, I've simplified all these sigmas here. Technically, this should be like sigma from i equals one at the bottom to n at the top for all these sigmas, but for you know, real estate, to save some real estate, I just put these as sigmas. But the point is, if you clean these equations up, you get these two equations. Now, if we look at this a little more closely, we have the sigma a naught term over here. We can actually simplify this to n a naught. Remember, n is the number of data points. Why can we do that? Because a naught's a constant. So you're basically saying, sum up all the constants. And let's say n equals three, right? So we're taking the summation of a naught from one to two to three. So it's just this term will evaluate to a naught plus a naught plus a naught, which is just n times a naught. So hopefully that simplification makes sense. So we plug n a naught in over here. Then we do some fancy rearranging, not really fancy, but we end up with this set of equations down here. Now I really hope this looks familiar. And if the structure at least doesn't look familiar, hopefully this equation or this matrix structure will look familiar. And now we have cast this in a linear algebra problem. Curve fitting, once again, is an optimization problem, which is a linear algebra problem. Okay, so this, this uh, image at the bottom comes directly from Dr. Vick's textbook. It's, I think it's pretty close to the beginning of chapter five, but uh, this is a fantastic diagram showing the relationship between AX and B. And this can be a little confusing. Uh, this is not the X vector. This is not the A matrix, and this is not the B vector. So don't think that these line up. Obviously, this is your A matrix. This is your, your X vector, and this is your B vector, right? This just shows you how they all relate to each other. But this is incredibly interesting. The B vector over here, our forcing function, is composed pretty much primarily of our Y points. The x vector is our unknowns, which should make sense because we're trying to find a not an a1. And then our a matrix, which is the physical system, is composed primarily of our x points. Huh, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty interesting representation, or uh, pretty in interesting perspective on curve fitting. So once again, we're thinking about these equations physically and what they mean. We're not just looking at the math, we're looking at how they apply to our context.
Okay. So you, you plug this into MATLAB or you RREF or whatever, whatever method you use, you're going to get these equations. All right. I'm not even going to bother to go over these because this is a freaking mess. However, let's look at A naught. A naught equals Y bar. Remember bar means the average. So Y bar, so the mean of Y minus A1, that uh, lump of stuff, times X bar, which is just the mean of your X data. Okay. Now that we have the two constants, we can go back to our best fit line and plug it in. So once we get numbers for these, we're done. Now, remember, you got to understand the nuances of all these equations. This best fit line will always pass through the mean of your data, even if the mean of your data isn't explicitly given in your experimental data set, right? It just, and it not just so happens, but like not by coincidence, but by design, the best fit line will pass through the mean of your data. And if you plug in X bar to this best fit line, okay, so we get A1, that mess, times X bar. Let's just leave it at that for now. Plus A naught. So A1 times X bar plus Y bar minus A1 times X bar. So the A1 X bars cancel out. You're just left with Y equals Y bar, right? So going back to the math, you plug this, this point in over here with these two constants, you get that result. Not a coincidence. This should be kind of intuitive if you think about what a best fit line actually does. Okay. And two weeks ago, I went this whole spiel about understanding the process instead of trying to memorize a bunch of symbols and equations and names and stuff like that. Everything I said about least squares up to this point pertains to first order polynomial. The two by two matrix we just solved here no longer holds if you need to fit, I don't know, a parabola, a second order polynomial. However, if you're going to fit a second order polynomial, the process is still the same. We define our objective function SR over here. And now we, so, so this, is, this is normal, but now we need to include a third term, A2 times X squared to make it parabolic, right? You can see it over here. And then you do the same thing. You take the partial derivatives, you do some fancy rearranging, you get this three by three matrix, which I'm not even gonna bother to try explaining because it's just a mess. Then you do your x equals a backslash b or RREF, whichever one floats your boat, and you're going to get values for your a with a naught, a1, and a2. So even though the equations themselves change, the process does not. Oh, and by the way, this extends all the way to whatever order polynomial you want. You want to do this with, with an 11th order polynomial? Great. You're going to have a lot of terms. You're going to have a big matrix, but the process will still be the same. Okay, so now that we have our best fit line, we're gonna switch gears and talk about how good our line is. All right, so equations 12 and 13 from the previous slides. So if we go back, these two constants, these constants produce the single line which minimizes the sum of the squares of the residuals, SR. Now the question is, how good is good? Oh, and by the way, if you choose any other constants, A0 and A1, aside from the ones that you get mathematically, they will have a non-minimal SR, right? That's just how the math works out. And that's just the definition of A0 and A1, all right? So going back to the question, how good is it? Let's bring back our friend S of T from earlier, all right? And here's, if you've forgotten, here's, here's just a quick refresher. S of T is the is the sum of the difference between the data points and the mean. So here's the mean. So it's just basically this difference squared. I should have put this squared here, but for sake of illustration. All right. So why am I bringing back S of T? Well, remember where S of T came from. At the very beginning, we presented five candidate methods for creating a best fit line. The very first method, method A, which is averaging all the data. And I said, ST was the baseline measure of the error. The other four methods that we looked at, even though they have their flaws, they all improved upon this method of just averaging the data. So we can use ST as a means of comparison to see, to, to quantify how much exactly we've improved. Right? And so we have ST and then we have S of R. Now, nuances of the equation. These two equations, this and this, structurally looks similar. 
you're taking a sum from one to n of something, some error measure squared. So they're measuring almost the same thing, right? And if you, it, and if you go back to the visual representation, that's exactly what they're doing. In ST, we're squaring the error relative to the mean. In SR, we're squaring the error relative to the regression line, right? So once again, these two equations look similar because they do similar things. You should be noticing what equations look structurally similar as well, and that should clue you in on whether you can use them as a means of comparison. Right? Just, just another piece of engineering analysis here. Okay. Well, if S of T was the error that we got before least squares, and S of R was the error that we got after least squares, the error difference between the two is S of T minus S of R. And we want to put S of T before S of R because ideally our least squares regression produces a lower error after than before. Right, so let's say S of T before we did the regression is 10. After we do the regression, least squares regression, hopefully S of R is something like six or two or something. So when you take 10 minus, I don't know, four, whatever, you're going to get a positive answer. All right, so that's why we put S of T before S of R. And we need to normalize this S of T minus SR because this is all scale dependent. And what, what we mean by that is if we normalize this right now, oh, by the way, just another thing, keeping track of units, these two numbers will have the same units. And these could be, I don't know, volts, hours, whatever meters per second, if you're measuring velocity or something like that, current could be gallons, some sort of flow rate, whatever. But because the units are inherently related to your problem, we want to make this dimensionless so we can use it to compare against other curve fits. So we can use this metric universally. In order to do that, because these two have the same units, we can normalize it with respect to S of T. And that will produce what we call the coefficient of determination or what you may formally know as R squared. So R squared is just the difference before and after the regression normalized with respect to before the regression. So here it is, and then in fractional form. And then if you wanna take out the fractions, just one minus S of R over S of T. And hopefully, once again, you've at least heard of it. But this is one way of telling us how good our best fit line is. Okay, so, so let's look at R squared a little bit more. If R squared equals zero, that means S of T and S of R are the same value, the same number. This means our error before and after is exactly the same. So by using least squares, we had no improvement over if we use the mean, right? That's, that's not good. If R squared equals one, then our S of R equals zero, or the sum of the squares of the residuals is zero. This is ideal. That means we got a perfect fit. And as you can expect, this rarely ever happens in practice, but we wanna get as close to R squared equals one as possible. Now, there's the very, very interesting case of when you can have R squared is less than zero. This means that your error after the regression is greater than before you even started. So your model is worse than if you just use the mean, which is bad, that's, that's what we don't want. And in a lot of textbooks, you won't even see R squared is less than zero because that's predicated on the assumption that your linear regression will by default be better than the mean. But it can happen depending on uh, what your application is. And let me, let me give you an example. So uh, this is based on something I read last night. I'll give you a million dollars to tell me the population of a state I'm randomly thinking of. I'm not going to tell you what state it is. You just have to give me a number. And as an astute student, you might decide to take a scientific approach and do a little curve fit. So you want to see if there's a correlation between the names of the states and their population so you can at least ballpark a guess. Um, fun fact, someone actually did this and ended up with a negative R squared. So that in, in, in this sort of context means that you are better off telling me the mean of the population of, of all the states rather than doing that regression across all the states and trying to ballpark an estimate, right? So there are some cases when you can have a negative R squared. And if that happens, uh, you have massively screwed up. So you got to check something and um, if you have a negative R squared, 
you need to backtrack from literally step one because that should ideally never happen. Okay. Unfortunately, there are many, many incorrect ways to interpret R squared. And this is sort of where we get into statistics too, because there are a bunch of different ways to improperly interpret a bunch of statistical measures too, which we're not going to get into the, the whole lot, but I just want to highlight that the correct interpretation of R squared is R squared is the ratio of the variance explained by the model divided by the total variance within the model. Right? It does not mean R squared is the number of original data points which pass through the regression line. Right? It also does not mean that you are R squared percent confident in your model. Finally, it does not mean that your regression line is R squared percent accurate. Those, these are all very incorrect, but very common misinterpretations. So shy away from these. All right, that's all I want to say about that. So here we have two data sets. The data set at the top hugs the line tighter, right? These data points at the bottom are pretty spread out. So if these data points hug the line tighter, then the residual is small, and therefore the sum of the squares of the residuals is going to be smaller which means that the R squared for the top one is higher than the R squared for the bottom one because the sum of the squared, the errors, is smaller for the top than it is for the bottom. All right, so here we have a high R squared. Here we have a low R squared, relatively speaking, of course. Okay, so we did least squares regression. We went through the whole process of taking partial derivatives, setting up your two by two or three by three matrix, solving for your unknown coefficients and stuff like that. And then we went over the basics of, of R squared, what it means, how to interpret it, how not to interpret it, and how to calculate it. So that's, that's it, right? Nope, uh, we're not done. So once again, this is an engineering analysis class, not just a numerical methods or not just a MATLAB class. So we still got some work to do. Okay, real quickly, I just want to touch on some of the limitations of R squared because it may be tempting to misuse this number. This is probably one of the most important slides in the entire PowerPoint. If you take nothing else away from this, at least know this. Having a high R squared doesn't necessarily mean your fit is good. Let me say this again. Having a high R squared doesn't necessarily mean the fit is good. Here's a really good example of that. There's some dude a long time ago named Anscombe. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but he produced four wildly different data sets as you can see here. However, these four data sets all have incredibly similar statistical properties. In fact, here you can see that, the, that they, they all have the same best fit line, right? It's y equals three plus 0.5x. Accuracy to two or three decimal places and the same R squared, 0.67, which isn't bad, right? However, if you look at this data, the line, the best line clearly isn't the best choice for some of the shapes, right? So for example, if I gave you this upper right data set, this parabolic or at least curvy looking data set, I told you to fit a curve. If you gave me this best fit line, I would fail you on the spot, right? Because this sort of tells me you either didn't plot the data or you don't understand what curve fitting does. And if you, if you understand what curve fitting does and you still gave me this straight line, I would say, well, why don't you fit a parabola or at least some sort of polynomial? And there's literally no good answer to that. Okay, so the, the big picture, right? The whole purpose of him doing this, if you, if you continue on and read the Wikipedia page, he said that he constructed uh, to demonstrate both the importance of graphing data before analyzing it and the effects of outliers and stuff. Right, the outliers and stuff for, for our purposes is irrelevant. However, demonstrate both the importance of graphing data. Now, if you recall, I posted in workshop three, a thing called on Canvas called workshop three pointers.pdf, which had this riddled every other page on it in big red font. And I repeated it because it's really freaking important, right? This is what we've been preaching since, you know, the second or third week of school. You should be plotting everything especially more now than ever, so you don't do something like this, all right? And look, if you're just going by the numbers, an R squared of 0.67 isn't bad, right? It's above half. 
which you can argue is pretty good. But a high R squared without knowing what the data looks like, without at least visualizing it, can lull you into a false sense of security. So with this being said, if I catch you doing a curve fitting problem and you don't plot at least the original data and the best fit line together, you're getting a zero on that problem. Mark my words. Because it's entirely foolish to at least not even look at the data to ascertain what the shape should be, right? Once again, this is clearly parabolic. There is no reason why you should be fitting a line when you can instead fit at least a second order shape to this. So plot everything, everything. Always plot, even if we don't require a plot, all right? So now that that is out of the way, the next topic of discussion is what happens if your R squared is low? Well, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. And it depends on your context. So uh, I've been speaking about context pretty heavily for the past couple of weeks. Um, one, one good example of the low R squared is I worked on a project a couple summers ago, and we were working on human perception of signs on the highway. We were trying to find a correlation between whether drivers uh, would see or how long drivers would look at a sign depending on how close that sign was to an exit off ramp on the highway. And what we found is that our data was incredibly noisy. When we fit that curve, our R squared was something like 0.35. Yeah, 0.35 to 0.4. And you might be thinking, okay, well, if R squared ranges from zero to one, that's absolutely terrible, right? But we were so ecstatic to get that R squared. Unsurprisingly, humans are a lot harder to predict than physical processes. So sometimes, like in our case, you might just end up with a low R squared because that's the nature of your work. So once again, it all depends on the context. An R squared of 0.3 or even 0.2 isn't necessarily bad. And on the flip side, a high R squared is a necessary but insufficient condition to ensure that you are predicting your output properly. So let's, let's go to this plot over here. We can see that more or less, this curve tends to approximate whatever data points were given. In fact, this R squared is 0.985, which is really close to one. However, you can make something called a residual plot. So if you plot, if you take this data point, plot the distance, you take this data point, plot the distance, plot its residual, et cetera, do that for all the data points, Look at this curve, right? The, the graph of the residuals. Obviously, what we can get from this is that this is sort of non-uniform. And so what this tells us is that our best fit line is systematically over and under approximating our data. So even though the R squared is real close to one, it's not necessarily good. So if you were to use this curve to predict what a point here is, well, I wouldn't be that confident because you have systematic over and under approximations. So ideally, this residual plot, all these residuals should be fairly close and compacted uh, around zero, right? Once again, the errors, or I guess I should say the sum of the square of the errors should be as close to zero as possible for a good curve fit. Okay, but going back to the idea of a low R squared, you can still draw significant conclusions with a low R squared. It all depends on the context, and we're gonna jump right into that. Okay, so R squared, as you know, goes from zero to one. And sometimes you may end up with a low, quote, quote, low R squared like I did when my application of about 0.35 to 0.4. So the question becomes, how high does R squared need to be in order to have a good curve fit? And that's a question I get asked all the time. And my, my response is another question to you. I actually assert that this is the wrong question to ask. Whenever someone asks me that, I always ask them, well, what's your goal? Is the goal of your curve fit to understand the input output relationship? Or is your goal to understand how to predict an output? Because these two things are very different. If your goal is to understand the input output relationship, your R squared is not totally, but very irrelevant. Why? Because if you're looking at the X and Y relationship or input output relationship, you're looking at what 
you're looking at how y changes with x. And so you're looking at a0 and a1. But a0 and a1 don't depend on r squared, right? So what, what is this equation, this, this equation from the very beginning, what, what does it even mean, right? So it says for a unit change in x, our y will be changed by an amount a1 and offset by an amount a0. It doesn't matter if my r squared for this curve fit is 0.1 or 0.99. It doesn't change the interpretation of a1 and a0, right? So if, if the goal of your curve fit is to understand the input-output relationship and nothing else, you should not be looking at r squared very heavily. Instead, what you should be asking is, can you trust the data? Can you trust that you collected the data points at enough precision or whatever to produce an output, to produce an input-output relationship, which is accurate? And then you should also be looking at, do the results fit the theory? So if we go back to that drag equation where I said f is proportional to the velocity squared. Well, do you have an a1, a0, and I guess you'll, you'll need another term for the squared term. Okay, those are things you should be looking at. And also, how do you interpret them? All right, so on the other side, if your goal is to predict the output given an input, now you need to take R squared into consideration. Once again, consideration is italicized because it's not the only thing you should be looking at, but at least now it has some weight. Why? Because when you talk about predicting something, you're implicitly talking about a margin of error, right? If I told you, predict the weather tomorrow, and you told me, well, it could be anywhere from zero to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, yeah, you're correct, but it's not a good prediction because zero to 200 degrees is a huge range. It's a huge margin of error. But if I asked someone else, hey, predict the weather tomorrow, and then you, know, you said, well, based on the temperature today, it was 80 degrees, so tomorrow, probably 80 plus or minus 10 or 15 degrees. That's a much smaller margin of error. Okay, so, so what, what does R squared have to do with this? Well, if you recall the definition of R squared, R squared innately deals with errors or residuals, I should say. So now your R squared becomes a factor, not the factor, but a factor, right? And once again, I have better questions for you to ask. Instead of looking at the R squared, you should be looking at something called prediction intervals. You don't touch that, but if you're taking stat, or if you will be taking stat, you will definitely be learning prediction intervals whenever you do something like ANOVA or multiple linear regression or R squared or stuff like that. You're also gonna be looking at stuff like F tests, P test, um, and other, other fun statistical variables like that. But once again, the point is, there are better questions you should be asking than how high does my R squared need to be? And on a side note, I just, the example I gave was, you know, predicting the temperature. That's sort of flawed because that falls into a whole nother class of problems called extrapolation, which is entirely different than curve fitting. So once again, it kind of, kind of goes to show that even though these topics may seem innately different, well, they're all sort of related, right? So this is why you should be keeping the, the big picture of all these topics in mind. Okay, so that leads me to another one of the most important points in this entire slideshow. R squared is one of many goodness of fit metrics. Go ahead and read the fit documentation on MATLAB, which you should do because you have a workshop problem on it, and it's on the practice test for the midterm too. All right? If you read the documentation carefully, you're going to see one of these outputs called GOF, which stands for goodness of fit statistics. And there, are, when, when, you, when you output F or GOF, there are five fields, right? One of which is the R squared coefficient of determination. So stuff that we literally just talked about. But there are four other things. Why? Because R squared is not the only goodness of fit measure in the, in the statistical world. Ideally, you would be using all these in tandem with each other. And when you get to a senior level class, I actually don't know if they're gonna do this anymore, but when I was a senior and I took ME4006, which I think they're cutting, but they might migrate the labs to another lab or something. One of the labs we had was we had to curve fit a bunch of data. And then we had to look at all five of these and based on what these values were, pick a polynomial curve fit that in our opinion, best fit this data. And everyone had different results because some people said, okay, well, I, I looked at the R squared and my R squared was the highest for a third order polynomial. But then someone else could have said, 
Well, I looked at what's called the RMSE, which and we're not going to get into any of this other than R squared, but someone else said, well, a fifth order polynomial produces the lowest RMSE. So I thought that was the best model. So once again, there's always going to be a trade-off between how many metrics you use because these all measure different things. So once again, this is why you have to understand why your context is important. Because in, in the experiment that, that I did a couple of summers ago, when we had the low R squared, we actually didn't even look at the R squared that much. We used another one of these metrics because, it, because the metric was developed, that, was, uh, that we chose was inherently developed better, better suited to our application than the R squared. So we looked at the R squared and we saw that it was from 0.35 to 0.4, but we were just like, okay, it's not the end of the world because according to another one of these metrics, that was just better. That was the better, then that's how we gained our confidence in our model, okay? And then the ultimate question, why does any of this matter? Well, if you're gonna be doing an experiment, I'm guessing you're gonna be curve fitting. And here we have your uh, class of 2022 and beyond check sheet, I think. And here we are, numerical methods, uh, MATLAB and stuff like that. And here are all the classes, at least I could find from the five seconds I looked at this with labs, right? And when you have a lab, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna be collecting a data. I'd say close to 100% chance you'll be collecting at least one, one piece of data across these four labs. So you will probably be using curve fitting, right? Definitely in 4005, because that's, that's what I took. And we definitely did curve fitting in many of the labs. All right, so this big picture, this is where this comes into play. And if you're looking for a more immediate application, well, yeah, workshop six, which is due this Sunday. And then there's also this decently important thing called your midterm, which I can guarantee will have at least one curve fitting question on it. So if nothing else, I assume you would like to pass the midterm. So you should pay attention to things like the R squared and the curve fitting and how to do all that. So at the bare minimum, you can pass both the workshops and your midterm. All right, so the final, final key takeaways from this is that least squares regression produces a unique best fit line, produces one best fit line. What exactly is that best fit line? Well, that best fit line is dictated by all your coefficients. If you have a first order polynomial or diagonal line, you have two coefficients, a naught, a one. If you want to fit a parabola, you're gonna have three coefficients, one attached to the x squared term, one attached to the x term, and one attached to the y-intercept, right? So you're gonna have an a naught, a one, and then an a two, and blah, 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 all the way for up for any order polynomial you want. How do you get these coefficients? Well, you take the partials and you solve via linear algebra. It's an optimization problem. And then once you have your curve fit, you need to evaluate it. You need to test if it's good or not. And you use R squared, or you can use R squared as one of the many ways to do that. But you should always keep in mind the context of your problem. R squared is not the be all end all. If you get a low R squared, that may be okay. If you get a high R squared, you should not immediately take off and assume all is well in the world because an R squared, a high R squared can be deceptive. All right, so uh, that's pretty much all I had for this presentation. Once again, go back to the beginning. This is all posted on Canvas and stuff. So if you want to keep this, download it for future use, whatever. But I just thought that today and tomorrow, Muhammad and I would like to do a brief overview of R squared, how to use it and stuff like that. Well, not necessarily how to use it because that's the focus of the workshop, but you can't do the workshop unless you know what R squared is, All right? So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and then, you guys got any questions, you can stay on the line, but otherwise, have a good weekend.